uh, on those who were elderly. And uh, it was also apparent that if you looked at elderly living on their own in society versus long-term care who needed some type of assisted living, um, it hit even harder on those uh, who had comorbidities and who needed uh, assistance uh, with living. And so uh, we also understood, I think, pretty early on that this was a virus that really thrived in close contact, congregate indoor settings, which obviously a lot of our nursing and long-term care facilities fit that bill perfectly. And so uh, we knew that that was a source of vulnerability um, in the state of Florida. And so the beginning or the middle of uh, March, uh, we took the step of suspending uh, visitation into these facilities because we feared that the virus could be brought in and infect people and spread and, and create um, obviously a lot of, uh, a lot of risks uh, to mortality and morbidity for the residents. Uh, we also prohibited individuals uh, from, we prohibited hospitals from discharging COVID positive residents back to nursing homes uh, if they had not cleared the illness. And um, I think that was something that, that was really critical in, um, in, in limiting uh, the spread. Uh, we also required facilities to implement strict screening uh, protocols for all staff and all contractors. Uh, we required all staff to wear PPE, uh, such as masks and gloves and, and face shields, but we didn't just tell them to do it. We put our money where our mouth is. The state of Florida sent uh, to just to long-term care facilities more than 10 million masks, more than 1 million gloves, more than half a million face shields and more than 900,000 gowns. And we were sending the PPE at a time when the hospitals were still trying to get a lot of PPE. And we were helping them too. The market was very tight. Uh, but, but my instinct was, look, if we can protect these long-term care facilities and limit infections there, the hospitals will need less PPE because these are the people that are going to be most likely to be hospitalized if they get infection. And so we thought that that was kind of getting ahead of it, doing that, and I think that um, you know that has helped limit uh, uh, some of the spread. We've also de we also deployed over a period of two months uh, 50 teams of National Guardsmen to test all uh, residents of long-term care facilities throughout the state, uh, all staff, and that's uh, over 4,000 facilities. We also have a mobile testing lab that has also been dispatched to nursing homes uh, to offer tests for residents and for staffs. Uh, we've sent incident management teams to every single nursing home and assisted living facility to check in on infection control practices like screening procedures, sanitation, and wearing PPE appropriately. Uh, and those teams are currently on the, their second round of visits, uh, which they will complete by the end of this week. Uh, we also required hospitals to test all individuals that were being discharged to a long-term care facility, um, even if they were uh, asymptomatic. At that time, we just we weren't sure whether there was spread um, inside the hospital, and we didn't want to send an asymptomatic senior back uh, to a nursing facility uh, who, who could then potentially uh, infect other folks. Uh, we're also now providing biweekly testing for all nursing home and long-term care facility staff. So this is over 200,000 staff members. Uh, they have a self-swab. We have a contract with a private lab who turns the results around in pretty good time. So that is ongoing. So there have probably been close to 300, uh, between three and 350,000 tests done just in the last month uh, with staff in long-term care facilities. And that's something we're gonna continue to monitor. The positivity rate amongst the staff has been lower than the state as a whole, but nevertheless, even at a two, three, or four percent positivity rate, you know, you're looking at a 200,000 people. You know, those are thousands of staff members uh, who've tested positive, um, and so that's something that we're trying to identify and isolate as best we can. And then, thanks to uh, the leadership of Mary Mayhew, uh, we uh, have created over the period of the last few months uh, 23 COVID-only nursing facilities. Uh, that have over 1,500 beds. And these are facilities that can be used uh, to transfer a COVID positive resident uh, out of a nursing home to a place where they can be uh, pro properly isolated. Uh, they could also be discharged from the hospital 
to a COVID only facility, even if they're still COVID positive, because the facility is set up to deal with that and you don't run the risk of putting them uh, in a regular nursing home and spreading it amongst the seniors. Here in Jacksonville, the Dolphin Point facility uh, has 146 beds. They have 121 uh, residents uh, who, who are currently being cared for there. So those are uh, a lot of steps. Uh, those are steps that have been important uh, in saving lives. Uh, at the same time, you know, those measures have come at a cost. Uh, you have residents of long-term care facilities that have other health problems. And we've had residents of long-term care facilities that have passed away for things other than coronavirus. Of course, this is, uh, this is kind of part, of, part of life. Uh, but throughout the last four and a half months, you know, they have not had the ability to have family members uh, visiting them. They've not had the type of human contact uh, which really, really makes a difference to people uh, who are in those conditions. And obviously it makes a, it makes a major difference for the caregivers and for, for the family members. And so uh, that human cost, the emotional cost of having these measures in place to try to limit the spread of COVID, uh, those costs uh, are profound. And when we went through it, you know, we knew that it was going to be something that, that was significant. Um, as we got into the end of April, all through May and the beginning of June, where the prevalence was very low in the state of Florida, we were with uh, Secretary Mayhew working on trying to figure out a pathway, you know, to get the families access again. Uh, that was being worked on. And of course, as we started to get into the third week of June, we started to see indicators increase in prevalence. And of course, um, you know, we've seen prevalence uh, increase. You know, we think we're uh, heading in a um, much better direction in terms of the trends uh, over the last um, uh, week or two. But nevertheless, increased prevalence, put, up, put kind of those plans aside because we wanted to make sure we were doing all our can to monitor the staff obviously work on protecting the residents and the general community. Um, but I think that uh, four and a half months is a long, long time. And uh, we've just got to look at this and say, is there anything we can do right now? Is there things we can do if certain indicators are met in a week or two weeks or a month? And I think a lot of the family members understand that these are difficult circumstances. Uh, I, clearly, they would not want uh, policies to be done that would lead to massive amounts of people in these facilities getting infected. Um, but I think that if you have a, 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 a way forward, uh, I think that would put a lot of people at ease knowing that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, one of the things when we were talking about before we came out, I talked with Mary and uh, both Marys, Mayhew and, and, and Mary Daniel, about, okay, you know, what do we know now? What could we definitely do right now? One of the things I think we can do is any family member who has COVID antibodies should be allowed to go visit the facilities. I mean, if you test positive for that, you know, we know that that confers uh, a certain uh, level of immunity. Most people think about six months at a minimum. Uh, we have not had anyone be reinfected, of course, anywhere in the world thus far. I would be comfortable saying, uh, you know, if you do have those, those uh, COVID-19 antibodies, you know, that you should be able to go in um, and, and, and see your family member. Uh, so we may work on that and may get moving on that. Then there's other things uh, that, that we can look at doing in, in, the, uh, in the short term. I've asked Mary Daniel to work with Mary Mayhew and all our guests here, form a committee, solicit feedback from families, uh, propose some steps forward that we can take as a state, and, um, and, and then let's see, let's look at that. Now, other states have tried some things. Some of it hasn't been terribly successful. So you learn from that and you figure out, and not even that it was causing more disease. I just think it was, it was inadequate for what the families really were looking for. Um, and so, you know, we want to make sure what we're doing is something that's really, really meaningful. But um, you know, if you think about over the last four and a half months, you have a, an illness that's obviously a contagious. There's a, an effort to, to limit the spread, of course. So you have people who end up in the hospital and for months, uh, they were not allowed to have family members uh, come and visit them. Even in their dying days, they were not allowed uh, to be able to do that. And I've had people come tell me, say, you know, we, you know my, my father was old or my mother was old, had health problems. You know, we understood this is, but to not be there uh, and be able to be there is something that really, really, uh, it leaves a mark. And so uh, I, I want to thank some of the hospitals 
who have um, allowed visitors uh, to come in in those end of life situations because uh, that is, I think, something that people will carry with them for a lifetime. Um, we obviously looking at long-term care facilities and understanding, you know, there are people that pass away in those facilities having nothing to do with coronavirus, yet they still didn't have their families to be able to be there as well. So it's not just people, you know, with coronavirus we're talking about. This has a broad impact on, we have uh, 150,000 residents or somewhere in that ballpark. Obviously, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of family members uh, throughout the state of Florida. So uh, we've got to figure out a way to not only protect folks from the virus, but also address some of the, the, the serious emotional um, damage that has been done by our countermeasures to the virus. And so that's why we're here today. Uh, I want to introduce the First Lady to, to make some comments, and then we'll hear from Mary, and we'll hear from the rest of our guests. I think I honestly could say it any better. Um, Mary, you were on the tip of our tongue this morning when the governor and I were getting ready to leave because we're surrounded by our three kids uh, who are wreaking havoc on the mansion as we speak. Okay, so we're trying to protect Florida's irreplaceable history every day. We've got a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and a four-month-old who, by the way, is not fully sleeping through the night. But we have our family next to us. We, we do. And um, you serve as an inspiration to so many people across this state because you found a way. You found a way in uncertain times to have some certainty. You were able to um, realize that these are precious moments that you can share with your husband because you say he recognizes you, you still mm -hmm. and you want to hang on to that as much as possible. So to be with him is so important. While these policies we know save lives, we know that we have to protect the vulnerable and those with underlying conditions because they're the most susceptible to this disease. Um, and so doing this from the onset was important because it did save lives. Now, as you know, for me, something that's very passionate and near and dear to my heart is mental health. And you and I have talked on the phone and talked in person about the ramifications and implications of what that means to be away from your loved ones. There are studies that talk about the importance of physical touch and what that does to depression and anxiety, to have somebody there in that capacity. And so I'm so encouraged by just sitting there and listening beforehand, before we came out there, there were ideas being thrown around that you have somebody who found a way, and for those who don't know the story of Mary, uh, it's really exquisite when these policies came down that we need to protect our vulnerable and we need to protect those with underlying conditions. She found a way, and that really is truly the American spirit that we will find a way to overcome. We will not let this define us. And so you got a job as a dishwasher to be able to be in the facility, to be able to be with your loved one. Now we need to make sure that other people can be with their loved ones too. And so um, for you to be a part of this now task force to be able to chart a course forward. Uh, again, we're not gonna let it define us. Uh, the governor said that so many times that we're gonna be able to be bigger and better and stronger. We just have to find that way. Um, so thank you for being here today. Thank you for everything that you have done, and thank you for your, for your understanding that in uncertain times we will find that certainty as we look at the science and we move forward. Um, you are an inspiration, and, and, and God bless you for everything that you're doing. So it's a, a pleasure to, to introduce Mary Daniel to speak a little so bit more on this. Thank you. I am honored to be here. This is, uh, I've been asking for this day f uh, since the first email I sent you back in March. So um, this is been a lot of work and culmination and I am thrilled to be with both of you and, and this group of people because these are the people that can come up with ideas and can make uh, the, I, I sit here representing hundreds of thousands of caregivers. It's not just me. I represent all of them and we are desperate and we are lonely and we are hopeless and helpless. And I get to represent us with this great team of people here and um, I am absolutely confident that we will come up with ideas to get us step by step this is not a fast, uh, un unfortunately, we, and we don't want to open the doors. We don't want to be foolish. We don't want to make mistakes here. It's incredibly important that we do it right. But I am truly confident that we are going to be able to get, um, get ideas and put them in, into implementation for, for the state of Florida. That will be copied, by the way, um, all across the United States. We have an opportunity to put out a roadmap. Um, our Facebook page is, uh, has, a, has a chapter in every single state. They are watching us today and they're watching what we're doing. And I'm thrilled to not, even, not only be able to do it for the state of Florida, but 
to really show the United States how we can make these uh, loved ones feel loved um, and nurtured and held and hugged again. So I appreciate the opportunity very much. Great. Uh, Mary Mayhew. Well, I'm, I'm humbled uh, to be here and, and to have had the chance to sit and talk um, with Mary. Um, Mary's situation and, and the desire to be with your husband, um, and as you say, there are thousands and thousands of families here in Florida, and I certainly have heard from many, and the governor and, no, and the first lady have heard from so many. And as we've said all along, you know, there isn't a day that goes by that my heart does not break. Uh, because of this policy. We, we today have an opportunity to provide hope, to provide a pathway to support the very connection that we constantly advocate for. We want people being uh, connected to their loved ones. When we think about what matters when you're in a residential uh, facility, when you're in a nursing home, when you're in an assisted living facility, it's that human interaction. It's the opportunity to be with family. But we also knew that the population most at risk from this deadly virus are our elderly, that the setting, that a residential setting, a, a nursing home, an assisted living facility, was most vulnerable to rapid transmission. And we, the governor led, we were determined to stand guard at the door uh, to protect our most vulnerable. Every single day we've learned something new about this virus, which also made it difficult to know every single policy change that needed to occur to protect. I'm proud um, of the work that we have done to protect our elderly. When you think about the percentage in Florida, uh, we have 4.5 million individuals over the age of 65 in our state. We have 154,000 individuals that live in nursing homes and assisted living facilities, over 200,000 staff. Every day, uh, we have talked about and thought about across all of our agencies, uh, with the governor, all of the various protections through since for over five months to, to protect our most vulnerable, our elderly individuals with underlying medical conditions. But we've also known about the, the consequences of the lack of, of human interaction, of family members not being able uh, to have that daily connection. You know, we've seen a lot in five months. We have an opportunity to create a framework to do this safely with leadership and, and engagement from Mary and others uh, who firsthand have seen, have, have uh, seen what the facilities are capable of. And together, I am confident that we can create a, an approach that stands, stays true to our goal of protecting our elderly, but supports what we all know is so critically important. Uh, we, I'm concerned about the mental health, about the physical health, uh, of, of our seniors in our facilities. And so this, this is exactly where we need to be. And we will, with great input, um, Secretary Prudham has done uh, such amazing work with the outreach and the engagement around the state. So we've got a lot of valuable feedback that we can uh, take advantage of to help shape uh, the right framework to safely allow visitation so that Mary and others have the opportunity to be with their loved ones uh, that is so critically important to all of us. So, Governor, thank you.